Uh, so welcome. So as a breakdown for the way tonight's going to work, the structure is going to be the same as last time. And so for anyone who wasn't here, I'm going to speak, then we'll break into smaller groups. We'll have leaders. Um, there are questions that I have made, but if you think of a question during, write it down. Um, if the leader wants to just uh, make up their own questions, that's fine. I'm going to come around again and sit with the groups. Um, I'll sit in on each one or, or at least walk by and listen. You can ask me questions as I come by, questions that come up. I may say nothing. I may, however, challenge you all a little more than I did last time. You came back, so now you're open to it. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the challenge in that group. So I'd like the leaders to at least go around and have the men say if they've came up with a challenge. If you don't want to share what your challenge is, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you, we'll talk about it more at the end. Uh, but at least share with the group that you were able to come up with a challenge for yourself for this 12 weeks, which is, I guess, now 10 weeks. Um, after the small group sessions, which I'm going to let those go a little longer tonight, we'll come back together into a large group again. And I really liked what Harlan Glenn did. Um, so if each group could have someone um, sort of summarize the main point or a really good point or an interesting point or even a question that came up in your discussion and share a little bit from each group, that would be awesome. Uh, we'll talk a little bit then about the daily devotional that Josiah has been blessing with us with, which has been awesome. Um, a little bit about the physical challenge group for those who are in it or anyone who would like to join us. And then we'll have a time of prayer. And then at the very end, we'll um, worship again together through song. And then I'll announce the topic for two weeks from now at the end as I send us off. Um, so last time, in asking the question, at least starting to answer the question, what is a man, we started at the beginning. And I hope you remember, um, but if you weren't here, uh, we can get you the, the message and you can go through it, but I hope you remember and have thought about some of the truths that we saw in that first uh, message. And they'll come up again and again. We'll basically be building off of those now for the next six we walked through Genesis 1 through 3 and asked from the word of God, what is it that you, God, have for us, men of God? And how would you have us be and live for the glory of God? That's our basic question. And again, we started in Genesis 1 through 3. We saw that there is no doubt that God created men. And God created us men to be men, to act like men, for men to lead in all spheres of life, to know how to to know the Word of God and how to lead others in the Word of God, to provide and to protect, and in all of those things in our main calling to take dominion. This is obvious from the Word of God, clear in the Bible. It extends into the New Testament, which we'll start to explore some of those things tonight, and even into the letters of the church and uh, into Revelation. Manhood and womanhood, we saw, is the focal point and was the focal point for the attack and the deception of the devil. And this is still the battleground in the world and in the church today. And men, as I said last time, my challenge to you in this is that you, that we would all together look to the word of God and even assess where us, where we ourselves have been influenced by deception or by the world. I said last time, so much has changed in the last 75 to 150 years, it's difficult to know even where we have drifted. And so we will begin now to let the word of God guide us in those things. I want you to see this. 1 John 5, 19 says this, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Which means any person any institution that is not of God, following God, we need to see and come to terms with that they are in the power of the evil one. Often deceptively so. And if we're being honest, we often don't want to admit this. Or we even have some reservation to call this out. As I said, I'm going to continue to walk around and even sit in on some of the small groups, but I want to warn you about something this time. I'm going to speak up if I hear something happening, and I hope the leaders will as well. 
there's a pitfall that, that we fall into often when we have these discussions. So there's one thing I want you men to even catch yourselves as you're answering these questions. And what is that? That when we answer these questions, when we think about these topics, when we have these discussions, we often talk as though we're on defense. What do I mean by that? Hear me in this. This is a bit of an admonishment, hopefully more of an encouragement. But since we're all men, and I was going to call this a manhood boot camp, I think, let me for a minute here be a bit more of a drill sergeant. Some of you, when you heard the questions last time, your gut response was to answer not the question, but to answer what biblical manhood is not. For example, the first two questions were, what should it mean for us men that we were created to fill the earth, subdue it, and take dominion over it and all God has given us? Or the second question, what should it look like in all areas of life and in the church that God created man from the ground to work towards the ground for the glory of God and he created woman from man to work towards man for the glory of God? And much of what I heard for answers to the questions were not answers to the questions, but instead were something along the lines of, it doesn't mean, or it can't mean, or it doesn't mean men have to do this, or it doesn't mean women have to do that. And there is a place for that, and I understand that. But what if I asked you on one of the questions, what is two plus two, and your answer was, it is not five. That's not very helpful. Or if I asked you, What does a quarterback do in a football game? And your answer was, he does not kick field goals. Also not very helpful. I think when it comes to these questions on what is a man, we immediately go on defense. My question to you, men, is what are you afraid of? Let's look at the Bible says, or what the Bible says, and glory in it. If you hear these teachings on biblical manhood and you go with the love of Christ in your heart and lead your wife, lead your family, act like a man, as the Bible lays out, of course you will not beat your wife. You will not be harsh with your family. But if all we get out of this time together is what biblical manhood is not, then the devil has won. We were created by God to be men. The question is how? What does this look like? How do we men do this? Today I'm going to start talking about, tonight I'm going to start talking about not only what we saw last week in Genesis, but expand now on specific parts of that, specific topics out of it, on what it means for us to be biblical men. We're going to take on some issues head on. Issues in the world in our day, issues in the church, we're going to do so unashamed to bring them to the light of the truth. Maybe even in a way that is a little more forward or forceful in a men's conference than I would say from the pulpit on a Sunday. Because that's what men do, and this is how men are to talk. 2 Corinthians 4, 10, 4 through 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Music to this? Awesome. It is a pretty glorious text. Maybe I should have kept going. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Did you hear that last part? We destroy arguments. We destroy arguments. And we destroy every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Do you have the weapons for this war? Are you ready to destroy every argument raised against the knowledge of God? Martin Luther once said, If you preach the gospel in all aspects, with the exception of the issues which deal specifically with your time, you are not preaching the gospel at all. 
We saw some foundational truths about manhood last time. If you, again, if you haven't heard the message, you need to hear it. We'll share it with you. Last time we saw God created everything. He took what was formless and void and gave it form and filled the earth. And when God creates, the form He uses gives its purpose. We saw both men and women created in the image of God and after the likeness of God. So we together are to display the glory of God and the attributes of God. We also saw that God created us perfectly and purposely different. Distinct. Not only in form, although in form, but in timing and what we were created from. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And why? For dominion. Verse 28, God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And we saw not only was this good, it was very good. God created man first before creating woman. He created man. He gave us men our specific purpose in the plan for us to take dominion. God created man from the ground that our work would be directed towards the ground. And then gave man our specific purpose. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. We'll come back to that tonight. And then we saw the very next thing God does after this in verse 16, before creating woman, which is very important. This will come up over and over again. Verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. So here God giving man this command, this law, this word of God is giving man both authority or headship, we'll come back to that, and the role of teaching the word of God to woman and by extension his children. And in our day this applies to the church. So as general concepts, we saw man was created by God to take dominion by working and keeping and authority to lead and to teach. Woman was created from man, for man, her work to be directed towards man as his helper, as they both, as image bearers of God, take dominion together, yes, but how? By man being man and woman being woman, which we'll talk about tonight. And yet the devil attacked this truth from the very beginning. He deceives the woman. She eats the apple. Man passively stands by. The woman is let to, allowed to lead. She teaches him. She provides the fruit. She authoritatively, authoritatively acts as his head. She tells him what to do. He provides no protection. And he takes and he eats. And the curses enter. Why is man cursed? Verse 17 of Genesis 3. And to Adam God said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse it is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So man listens to woman's authoritative word. He knows the truth. In a way, he fears her over God. And instead of taking dominion, authoritatively leading, providing headship, protecting Sin enters the world. Man's work is now cursed. Woman is cursed in her primary role in taking dominion. She's cursed in childbearing, even cursed in her relationship with the man. That she will have to fight the temptation of the curse to be contrary to man or even rule over man. And the devil is cursed. And praise God, in the curse of the devil, the gospel is revealed. Verse 15 of Genesis 3. God says to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That although we now, and they then, were under the curse, a man, one will come, God promises, a Messiah king will win the war by crushing the devil. And who is this Messiah king who was killed for us on the cross? but only bruised because he rose again. Who is this one that will come from the line of Eve? Who is the Satan skull crusher? Jesus. 
Jesus came to be the perfect man. Jesus came to live the life we could never live. Jesus came to take the curse upon himself on the cross. Jesus came and he died. He died on the cross for our sins. And he rose again to life. If you have not repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus, that Jesus, to follow him by faith all the days of your life, do it now. But if you have, men, if you have, if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, and you have the Holy Spirit of God in you to live as a redeemed man in a way that is very good, to take dominion, to lead, to provide, to protect. So with those as our general concepts, let's dig deeper into specific ways we men are biblically told how to be strong and act like men. I want to give you one more warning. I am going to hold up biblical manhood as high as I can. Which isn't all that high, I'm kind of short. But. To the point where some of you men might think, is he overdoing it? And I would say no. I am still underdoing it. I just saw a survey this week where a way too large percentage of men who would call themselves evangelical Christians... These men would say they go to a biblical church. These men would say they are believers and followers of Jesus. And all of a sudden, these men believe that men can choose whatever gender they want to be. That is the end point of the battle we have seen in the garden. That is the outcome of allowing these beliefs in the world to infect our minds and our churches. I hope you would agree with me, that is not biblical. But what's harder to measure than the obvious, although those were men who, who go to church who would call themselves Christian, what's harder to measure than that obvious mistruth is the in-between. Is how much we have been affected by an effeminate view of manhood, an effeminate view of the church. So let's look at a specific way in which we men can be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong. Let's see how we men can be, tonight's message, be God-fearing men, God-fearing men who provide and protect. Truth number one. Biblical men are God-fearing. Biblical men are God-fearing. You'll see, as we, as we roll through these messages, tonight is almost introduction part two. Because as we keep going, they'll, they'll get more specific and more specific. This truth is implied in the Genesis account and implied in the fall. I know this seems like an obvious truth to you men. Like, do I really need to come to a conference on a Monday night to find out that biblical men fear God? We live in a world where the majority of men who call themselves Christians do not know or fear God. We live in a world that is obsessed with self. A world full of fear of man. A world where you can name and claim your own identity. And yet we see in the garden the truth. And what is that truth? God created man. God is creator. God gives us our mission. God gives us our identity. God is always right. God created man first. He created man from the ground. He gave man our identity when he created us in his image and after his likeness. And yes, he created women after his image and likeness as well. But as you will see in my second point, we were created men to be men. And since God is our creator, the first real practical, true quality of a biblical man is a biblical man is a God-fearing man. There are men out there like Jocko or Jordan Peterson or even Joe Rogan. They have millions of young men listening to them every day because they've picked up on something. That manliness is a good thing. Young men are flocking to their teachings. Yet something major Maybe the most, no, the most major thing is missing 
from their podcast and their teachings. The truth that real men fear the Lord. Why do we fear the Lord? Because he's awesome. Because he's powerful. Because he is mighty. And because he will not let sin go unpunished. God has created us and just as quickly could punish us and cast us away from his presence because of our sin and every, sing <clears throat> every single one of us would deserve it. In the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, verse 28, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Biblical men fear God. Here at Revival yesterday on Sunday, we saw that the gospel starts with God. Specifically with the fear of God. In Revelation, we get this picture of an angel flying overhead. We're told by John that this angel has a message. Verse 6 of Revelation 14, John says, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. What is this eternal gospel this angel has? He says with a loud voice in verse 7, Fear God. Give Him glory. Because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The gospel starts with God. The eternal gospel here is said to start with the fear of God. Fear God, give Him glory. He will judge, so worship Him. The wise man Solomon at the end of Ecclesiastes, after testing and considering pretty much every way of living, he says this, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. In other words, the eternal gospel, fear God, give Him glory, worship Him. No one will ever, ever fully repent and believe upon Christ for salvation if they do not know that they need salvation. And that starts with the fear of God. We know we cannot do this on our own. We cannot keep all of His commandments. But man, because of the gospel, we are made new. We are redeemed. We are redeemed men to now properly, with joy in our new hearts, fear God. We know Proverbs 1.7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's just the beginning, though. Look with me at Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. The rest of it's a promise. The rest of it is this blessing he's talking about. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. And then look what he says. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness before the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments.
So I have some homework for you. You can write this down. Study that psalm this week. It gives us some insight at what it means to fear the Lord. What our lives will look like if we fear the Lord. What we'll do with our money if we fear the Lord. What our families will look like if we fear the Lord. What will happen to our enemies if we fear the Lord. Now ultimately, that psalm, like every other word in the Bible, is pointing to the perfect man, Jesus Christ. And the wicked man sees him and is angry. Because he will perish and Jesus will win. Yet, there is truth in that for us. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Do you fear the Lord? Do you greatly delight in his commandments? This means here, a man who fears the Lord will be a man who loves his Bible. Greatly delights in the commandments of the Lord. A man who fears the Lord will also be confident and overflowing. I don't have this one, but it was in the devotional today. Proverbs 14, 26, and 27. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. Did you hear that? In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. And his children, his children will have refuge. Probably our last session, we'll be talking about generational manhood. A man who fears the Lord, his children will have refuge. Verse 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. That one may turn away from the snares of death. Not only is the fear of the Lord a fountain of life, it, life will overflow from the man who fears the Lord. And it keeps us from sin. The one, the one may turn away from the snares of death. So the first question, based on the first truth tonight, the first question to ask yourself is, what is your personal relationship like with God? Do you fear the Lord? The fear of the Lord will drive biblical men to love Jesus, to honor Jesus, to be blown away that we have been saved by Jesus. Because out of proper fear of our awesome God, we will properly live by faith as men of God who love the word of God and delight in the ways of God. Which brings me to number two. Biblical men are men. <clears throat> if you thought point number one was obvious, biblical men fear the Lord, here truth number two is biblical men are men. Unfortunately, based on the survey I told you about within evangelical churches, this truth is not so obvious anymore. We were created to be men, to be manly, not to be feminine. In Genesis, it says male and female he created them, and God makes sure we know for sure men are like this. Women are like this. Men do this. Women do this. I want to be abundantly clear here. I am not trying to persuade you of some 1800s Puritan roles for men and women, although they had a lot right. I'm trying to persuade you of the biblical authority and roles given to men by God, and that we men would clearly love them, live them, and by the power of Christ in us, unashamedly and lovingly desire to glorify God as men. Listen to David's words, his last words. He's about to die, and this is what David says to Solomon. 1 Kings 2, 1 through 3. When David's time drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. Keep, charge, keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. David is not saying to Solomon, go get a blood test and see if you have X and Y chromosomes. He is saying there is such a thing as acting like a man. Go do it. And notice he also tells him in this, you don't just get to say I'm a man. 
Go act like a man. Go show yourself to be a man, he says. How? Keep the charge of God. Obey God. Or fear God. Or be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. There it is again. Act like a man. We see a distinction throughout the New Testament. Jesus chose all men as disciples. There are no laws against something like this in California. Men are qualified and called and chosen to lead every church in the New Testament. It is the first qualification to be a pastor, elder, or overseer in the New Testament to be a man. Being a man does not in any way automatically qualify one to be a pastor or elder. Far from it. But if one is not a man, he is not qualified to be a pastor or elder. Or she, I guess, better said. More on that in a few sessions. There are many clear and obvious differences in authority and roles for men and women. First in marriage. We'll see that in a later session. How about the way we dress? Deuteronomy 22.5 A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord our God. It doesn't get much clearer than that. Summary of that one. Dress like a man. This also has implications for war, by the way. If you dig deeper into this verse, it is also saying men go to war. Not women. The next verses are a little triggery. To be a woman in war is used by God as an insult to the men. When God decrees that an army will fail because of their evil or weak ways, God says, Jeremiah 50, 37, a sword against her horses and against her chariots and against all the foreign troops of her midst, that they may become women. He's saying to, to this army that is not acting like men. They're not fighting like men. They're evil. Jeremiah 51, 30, the warriors of Babylon have ceased fighting. They remain in their strongholds. Their strength has failed. They have become women. So men, created by God to be men, different in authority, different in role, different in the way we dress, different in war. Even hair length reflects these distinctions. 1 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. Does not nature, nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman long, wears, has long hair, it is her glory. There are clear New Testament differences, distinctions, in what men and women can or cannot do, even how they're to present themselves in the gathered church. Women are said to, to be silent and less covered, and then for prayer and prophesying. And whether you agree with me or not on head covering, we can talk about that later, it is clear in 1 Corinthians 11. God clearly lays out differences between men and women. Verse 3, 1 Corinthians 11. I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of woman, and woman, and God is the head of Christ. Verse 9. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And then back to 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Now, almost every time I bring up that verse, I'm asked a question afterwards. And the question I'm often asked is, do I really think Paul meant act like men? Because some translations translate it, be courageous. Or be brave. And I think based on the Greek word that is used, that falls short of what Paul meant. The Greek word translated act like men is the word andrezomai. Andrezomai. I once heard a preacher, Owen Strawn, say that real biblical men should have this Greek word tattooed on their arms. And then he said, if they're real men, they'll put it on their necks. But I think he was kidding. Modern translations soften this word. The Greek word androsomai means male. It means come to manhood. It, mean, it is the word where we get the prefix andro. For example, the prefix andro means male. Testosterone is an androgenic hormone, a male hormone. 
The word androsomai only appears one time in the New Testament. It appears 22 times in the Old Testament. Septuagint. And it is sometimes translated, be courageous. But I don't think when Paul uses it, he's saying simply be courageous. I think he's saying be a man. Again, this word means come to manhood. It was used by the Christian martyr Polycarp, an apostle of John. Polycarp was quoted. He enters a stadium coming to his death. A voice, he said, came to him from heaven. And the voice said, be strong. Be strong, Polycarp. Play the man. Same word. Play the man. Act like a man. Play the role of a man. Be a man. We might say, man up. When the culture we live in says man up or be, man, be a man, it could mean many things. In our day, who knows what it means? When the Bible tells us to act like men, what does it mean? What does it mean to play the role of a man, to be a man, to be a biblical man? Well, to act like man is also not to act like a boy. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. To be a man is also a biological fact. I am a bit of a biolog biologist of sorts. And I know you men know this, but men and women have different body parts. On average, men have 1,000% more testosterone than girls. One final point on this one. For a man to act like a woman or to be soft is a sin. Effeminacy is a sin. To be an effeminate man is a sin. Go read the Church Fathers. They talk about this often. There's a book written in 200 B.C. with a whole chapter about this. Unfortunately, the word that chapter was based on has been taken out of most modern translations. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, 9, chapter 6, verse 9. I'm first going to show it in the ESV. And those of you that know me know I love the ESV. I use the ESV, I study the ESV, I preach primarily from the ESV. And I can tell you why after if you want to talk about that. There are also other good translations. However, most modern translations translated after the year 2000 have drifted a bit. Specifically, especially, have removed the word effeminacy from this verse. Let me read the verse. It's a serious verse. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So Paul, New Testament, Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, there are these unrighteous who will not go to heaven. They will not enter the kingdom of God. And then he says this, do not be deceived. Do not be tricked about this. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Now when you get to the end of this, he says to this group, which has drunkards and homosexuals and, and uh, people who previously practiced this sin, these sins, in the group, he says, such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been cleansed. The gospel has changed you. You no longer are these things. You no longer practice these things. But here he says, those that do, we should not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will enter the kingdom. But I want you to look with me at a translation before the year 2000. There's an extra word. The NASB 1995. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate nor homosexuals. There's a word between adulterers and homosexuals that was not in the ESV. And if you look at almost any modern translation, the New King James, 
uh, the N NASB that was translated after 1995, I forgot what year it is. Almost every new translation has removed this word. The word effeminate is in the original Greek. Previous versions of most of these translations have the word. The ASV has it. The King James has it. Here the NASB 1995 has it. The word effeminate. Paul is saying to us, the effeminate man, the girly man, will not enter the kingdom of God. Men who act like women, or more closely translated, soft men will not enter the kingdom of God. The Greek word is the word malikos. It means to be soft, most often translated to be effeminate. John the Baptist actually uses this word. He's asked, why do you dress in such a rough way, John? Why do you dress and live in such a rough and hard way? And his answer is, what did you expect? The one who was the forerunner of the Christ to come dressed like a soft man? An effeminate man, a malicose man, same word. John's like, did you expect the one who was going to come and proclaim the Christ was coming to be soft? To be effeminate? So we should ask, why would it be that effeminate men would not enter the kingdom of God? Because God made us to be men. What a sin, what a dishonorable thing for us men to say to God, no, I'm going to act like a woman and let women act like men. Until the last hundred years, the word effeminate was a common word used in the church. Used as a sin in the same line as adultery and homosexuality. When I saw that this word had been removed from most modern translations, it started a fire in my belly that will not go away and actually was one of the things that led to us standing at this conference right now. Excuse number two. May we men be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, or we could now say not be effeminate and be strong. We have, we're in a culture where men are, and boys are told they can be women, go into women's bathrooms, into women's locker rooms, play in women's sports, dress like women, wear dresses, even be led by women. We live in a world where boys are told they need to get in touch with their feminine side. To steal a line from Michael Foster, that is like a dog trying to get in touch with its cat side. It doesn't have one. Man, you do not have a feminine side. Well, maybe I have a feminine side, and her name is Elissa. It's time for us men to tell the devil to get the hell out of our homes and out of our churches, and for us men to be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and act like men. Be strong. We're going to quickly now look at two truths, two things that God-fearing men, men who fear God and are men, what do we do? We're going to start with the first two things God tells man. Number one, or truth number three, biblical men provide. Biblical men provide. Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it, to work it, and to keep it. We'll talk about the first one first, to work it. The Hebrew word, therefore, work it, means to provide through toiling. To provide through toiling, or to serve through laboring. Simply put, God-fearing men, men of God, give of themselves to provide for others. Men of God give of themselves to provide for others. We'll see this in many ways as we go on, as husbands, as dads, as leaders, as elders, as pastors. We men are to give of our time, of our talents, of our money, of everything we have to provide for those in our care or anyone God would bring us that is in need. 
Does this mean that men are commanded to work to care for their relatives? Or, more simply, should you have a job that you use the money to care for others? Answer, yes, if you are a man. The New Testament is clear on this in a shocking way. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wait a minute. Denied the faith. Worse than an unbeliever. One study Bible put it this way, provision for one's own family is a spiritual issue and is of utmost importance. Failure to live out the gospel in this way is tantamount to denying the faith. Or based on what we've seen, man, you were created by God to have people in your life that depend on you. That you care for. That you go out and work to provide for them. This means here physical provision, financial provision, food, shelter, clothing, work to make money and use that money to provide for your family, for your church, for those in need. This is clear. To not be providing is to be worse than an unbeliever. Yes, there are exceptions to this. Disability and other things. However, as a general statement, it doesn't get more clear than this text. And yes, first and foremost, this means household. This means relatives. This means those in your care who are of your family. But also remember, as a believer, you are to be part of a household of God as well. In what ways, men, are you providing for your household and for that household? We'll see in later sessions, this very much includes spiritual provision. Men are to be spiritual providers as well. Final truth for tonight, biblical men protect. Biblical men protect. Genesis 2.15 again. The Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to work it. We talked about that one. And now to keep it. To keep it. The Hebrew word, therefore, keep it, means to keep watch over it. To watch over it. To guard it or to preserve it. We saw that the first man did not do this. Even worse, he stood by. He watched instead of watching over. This verb is used elsewhere to refer to the action of God watching over his people or a military guard guarding over a city. Even to protect your household from thieves. Exodus 22, 2 and 3. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck by the household man of the house, right? And he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But if the sun has risen on him, if, if he got away and the, the sun rises now, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. There is a place for physical protection. I'm not going to go deeply right now into any Christian debates about carrying guns, but let me simply ask you one question. If you're married, or if you're not, imagine you are, you're lying in bed with your wife and you hear something and you say, Hey, honey, I think that might be an intruder. Will you go take care of it? Enough said. We men are to keep watch, be watchful, to provide and to protect. In the New Testament, we're given three specific ways to do this. Paul includes this in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He starts with be watchful. Watch over, protect, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. I'm going to give you three ways quickly that this applies to us men here. How can we be watchful? How can we protect? In what ways are we to have watchfulness? So this is sub-points under truth number four. They'll be quick. 
Number one, watch for Jesus. Number one, watch for Jesus. Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, stay awake. Same word. Be watchful. Same word. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. No matter what your eschatology, no matter what you think will happen specifically at the end of time, one thing is clear. We do not know the day or the hour of Jesus' return, but He will come like a thief in the night in the blink of an eye, and we are to live every moment as though His return is imminent. And you are to watch over yourself with that in mind and watch over those in your care with that in mind. Number two, watch for the devil. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Same word. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seek, lion seeking someone to devour. And that someone there may be you. Might be your wife, your child, someone in your church, a friend. Be watchful. Be watchful. Seeking someone to devour. This extends beyond our personal responsibility, our responsibility for others. Let me say something to you men here. If Satan has snared you, If Satan has snared you in your life, whatever the sin might be, whether it is pornography, video game addiction, any other sin that has a hold on you, what do you do? 1 John 1, 1.9 If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do not stay in sin. That is what the devil wants. Confess your sins to the Lord. He's faithful and just to forgive you and will cleanse you from it. It's a promise. This confession may include James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. If you can't even find a way to confess or pray for yourself, the enemy's prowling and he prowls in the darkness. One way to be watchful of the devil is to walk in the light and bring your sin to the light. You are not meant to overcome this on your own. You may need to confess to someone else that they might pray for you. One more way in which this works. How do we watch for the devil? How does this work in, in the setting of the biblical church? Hebrews 10, 24-27. Often we stop at verse 25. I'm going to keep going for two more. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So watch for Jesus, right? All the more as you see the day drawing near. Watch for Jesus. Gather together. Don't stop gathering together. Even if the government tells you to stop gathering together, don't stop gathering together. Why? Look at verse 26 and 27. Because. For. Here's the reason. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. The devil's prowling. We need each other. You see the connection. Gather together so we can be watchful so that none of us might stay stuck in sin. The third way to be watchful is watch for yourself and your doctrine. Number three, watch yourself and your doctrine. Watch yourself and your doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.16 Keep a close watch. Same word. Keep a close watch. Be watchful on yourself and on the teaching. The word there is doctrine. And on the teaching. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. And then watch what happens. Persist in this. And by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is like on the airplane when they say, put on your own mask first. 
Man, if you aren't right with the Lord, if you're not keeping watch on your own life and your own doctrine and your own teaching, you're of no use to anyone else. But if you do, it says you will save both yourself and your hearers. This spills over into our protection of others. Watch over yourself and your doctrine, and in doing so, you will save both yourself and others. Oh, the power and the glory and the responsibility God has given us men. Tonight we have seen biblical men are God-fearing men who provide and protect. So may we together be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and let all that we do be done in love. Amen? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the way you do not leave us without guidance. We come before you as men who need you. Even fearful of what our lives would be like without you. Even knowing that we have no power to do any of these things on our own, Lord. And yet you command us to do these things. Which puts us in great need of you, Lord. Help us. Help us men to act like men. To be watchful even over one another as men. To be spurred on and encouraged to provide, protect, to continue to dig into your word, Lord, so we would know what you have called us men to be and to do. And we thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us to figure it out on your own. You came for us. You, Jesus, are the perfect man. Help us to follow you, to follow you by faith all the days of our lives. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.